And Acts chapter 2 is where we're going to be going tonight. I, I've been wanting to preach this message for a long time and just kind of uh, waiting for the right time, kind of wanting to get a few uh, questions answered, I guess. I, the, the subject I'm going to be preaching about tonight is extremely controversial. Okay, What I'm about to preach to you tonight, um, you know, what I believe the Bible clearly, clearly teaches, many... You know, good preachers, you know, what I would consider good preachers, guys that I like, would call me a heretic for what I'm about to preach. Uh, I listen to a preacher that I enjoy listening to. He's a good guy. But he was talking about people who believe this, and he kept calling them heretics. And I'm, I'm listening to this guy talk, you know, call, call us heretics, and I'm just like, how can we be heretics for this? It's so clear it's spelled out in the Bible. And, you know, there are some things in the Bible that, you know, I see where people are coming from. I see, you know, you know, yeah, I disagree with them. I'm convinced they're wrong. But you know what? I can see where a person could get tripped up there. And it's like, why can't they see that in some areas? Because what I'm about to show you is spelled out in the Bible. It's so clear and these people who will call people like me a heretic for this, I mean, these are King James Bible believing people. People who don't believe you ought to correct the Bible, you know, with the Greek and Hebrew. People who believe that every word of this Bible is inspired, but for some reason, and I know the reason, and I'm going to share the reason with you, for some reason, they will call this a heresy and they will throw a huge fit and they get all insul insulted. And listen, if you've never heard this before, you know, don't get freaked out, all right? It, it's, it, you don't need to get freaked out. It's, it's in the Bible. It's truth. And that's and so the title of the message is, Did Jesus Go to Hell? Did Jesus Go to Hell? People get freaked out by this. Years ago, at my dad's church, one of the uh, an older man in the church, he was a hardcore soul winner, and he was out soul winning, and somebody was with him, I don't even remember who it was, and he was talking to this person, he's giving him the gospel, and he mentioned how Jesus went to hell. And this person got all shook up. And was like telling everybody in the church, you know, this guy said Jesus went to hell. You know, what's going on? And, you know, it was like, and, and people do, they, they spaz out about it. I've had people call me up because of some of the preachers I associate with. They're like, did you know he believes Jesus went to hell? And I'm like, yeah, don't you? But no, no. And, and, they, and they just absolutely spaz out by it. And honestly, I, I don't get why people get so freaked out by it. I, now I, and I even understand why some people don't believe it because of why I'm going to show you people struggle with this, but I don't understand why people get so freaked out. And so let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 2 because Acts 2, it lays it out for us. I mean, it tells us clear. It says in Acts 2, uh, 2 verse 22, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. When people read this, they read over that really fast. People who don't believe what I'm preaching to you right now. He loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Um, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad, moreover my flesh shall rest in hope. Be uh, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption." Because thou hast made me to know the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul, talking about Jesus, his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all, we all are witnesses. So Peter right here, he's speaking, he's preaching, and he says, 
He's quoting Psalms. He's quoting Psalms chapter 16, verse 10. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine holy one to see corruption. When Jesus died, his body was placed in a tomb, correct? His body was placed in a tomb. That was a holy one. And it did not see corruption. Why? What's that talking about? His body did not rot away. It did not deteriorate. It did not. Why not? Because God raised him from the dead. Okay, but his soul went to hell. And people freak out about that. People spaz out about that. But listen, it says right there in the Bible that his soul was not left in hell. And so you've got these people like, well, it says he went to hell. But you know, I don't, I don't believe he suffered in hell. I don't believe he burned in hell. Well, then what in the world do we do with verse 24 when it says, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death? Because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. Because people say, no, Jesus didn't go to hell, he actually went to paradise. Okay? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna prove how that's not what, you know, that's not what they're saying. I don't believe that hell is actually paradise. Okay? I believe hell is hell and paradise is, is paradise or heaven. But listen, if Jesus was in paradise during those three days, why did he be, need to be loosed from the pains of death? Okay? Why? He's, he's dead. Where's the pain? Well, it wasn't in the body because the body was dead. But his soul was in pain because his soul was in hell. And it was not possible he should be holding of it. Why? Because he was not sinful. He, when he went to the cross, he was paying for our sins. And God raised him from the dead. But he was in the heart of the earth where hell is for three days and three nights. What else would he have been doing down there? And there are some crazy theories. And I'm going to show you how these theories are based on nothing. They take little sentences in the Bible. They take it out of context. And I'm going to show you how these things, if you just do a little bit of reading, you're going to find out it it's actually means what the Bible says it means. And so why I believe Jesus went to hell is, first of all, the Bible says he did. It just, I mean, it flat out says he did. It says he went to hell. And you know, just reading Acts 2 leaves no doubt that Jesus went to hell and he suffered pain in hell. But this isn't enough for many people who call themselves Bible believers. That's not enough. You know, but Matthew 12, 40, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was in hell that whole time. He was in the heart of the earth that whole time. He didn't go down there, get all the Old Testament saints and take them to heaven and then resurrect. No, he was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And I'm going to show you that paradise or heaven has never been in the heart of the earth. And I know what some are thinking, rich man and Lazarus story. I will, I will prove to you that, that the rich or the, that Lazarus was not in the heart of the earth. Okay? That is... That is ridiculous. That is not that is not biblical at all. So first of all, I believe he went to hell because the Bible just flat out says he did, and it says he was in pain. That clearly in Acts chapter two, and also Jesus said he would taste of death for every man. Okay, now listen, Jesus's physical death on the cross was not tasting death for us. How dare you say that? You know, no, listen, that's not tasting death for us. You know, because of the fact. Okay, listen, he died on the cross for us, right? He died on the cross paying for our sins and he died, he suffered death. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And we all say this, I think all soul winners say this, when you're out preaching the gospel, you know, it's not just physical death, but it's talking about spiritual death, death in hell. We all, we all say that. We all, we all teach that. And Jesus, he died for us so we wouldn't have to. But wait a minute. Don't we die too? We all die physically. We all are going to die a physical death. But if we're saved, we will never die a spiritual death. We will never taste of death. We will never taste of hell. We will not spend one second in hell. We will not. The, the penalty of sin is death. Did Jesus not pay that penalty for us? Did he not die for us? He tasted of death for us so we wouldn't have to. And so, you know, if, if Christ doesn't return soon, we all will taste of death physically. But we will never taste of it spiritually. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. Jesus experienced both for us. 
And so, in Hebrews 2.9, it says, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man, because it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. It, right, he did it through sufferings. Okay, Jesus suffered. He did suffer on the cross. I'm not gonna, I wouldn't take anything away from that. But listen, He suffered death. He suffered in death. All others who are lost and do not receive Christ they suffer death. And they suffer in death. They suffer in a literal place called hell. And that is where the Bible says Jesus went. Jesus had to do that. Why? Because He is tasting of death for every man. And that's not just physical death. Look what it says in John 8.51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then say the Jews unto him, Now we know thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead, and the prophets are dead? Who makest thou thyself? Now wait a minute, if Jesus says, if you'll keep my sayings, you'll never see death, then shouldn't that mean we'll never die? Well, what's that talking about? Because Christians die, don't we? Physically, but spiritually, we never die. The Bible teaches we go to sleep. Yeah. Why do we go to sleep? Okay, because I was talking about this in the nursing home today. You know, my kids, they've been out cold before where they kind of looked dead. But you know what? They weren't dead. Proof of it was they woke up later, didn't they? They got up. And you know what? One of these days, our body is going to die and it's going to lay down and it's going to get buried in the ground, but it's going to wake up eventually, isn't it? It's going to wake up at the return of Christ. We're just asleep. Hey, our body is asleep. It will wake up one of these days because we've been saved. And so we will, we're never going to see death. I will never spend one second in hell. And Matthew 22 verse 31 says, But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, where am I going with that? Well, remember what the Jews just said to Jesus? Abraham is dead. The prophets are dead. But Jesus said, I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, where was Abraham's body during that time? It was in a grave. Where were the prophets' body during that time? It was in the grave. But Jesus said, they're not dead. They're living. And, look, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but people try to say, no, there was this place of the dead that was good, that was paradise in the heart of the earth. No, they're living. Okay, They were living. They were with God. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And listen, even though saved people's bodies die, we never die spiritually because Jesus did that for us. He tasted of death for us. The difference between the death of a saved person and a lost person is huge. The lost people go to hell. And Jesus did that for us and it will never happen. Jesus tasted of death and the Bible says we will never taste of death. And how can that, so how can that be possible? How did Jesus, if, and these people say, no, Jesus' taste of death was him just dying on the cross. But wait a minute, I'm going to die that kind of death one of these days. All other believers die that kind of death, of physical death, but we will never die the spiritual death because we've been given eternal life. Amen. And Jesus tasted of death for us and that can be nothing other than the same death of the lost and that's hell. Well, why would Jesus have gone to hell? Because when He was on the cross, He who knew no sin became sin for us. He was bearing our sins. And he died like a sinner with our sins on him. And therefore, he went to hell for us. But because, of, because he was the Son of God, because of the fact that he lived a perfect life and he was making payment for us, God accepted it and God raised him from the dead. Because it couldn't hold him. The pains of death weren't going to hold him. God loosed him from the pains of death. And you know, we don't ever see anywhere in the Bible where God's going to loose anyone else from the pains of death. 
You know why? Because they are guilty. They didn't receive salvation, but Jesus Christ, who is salvation, he was loose from the pains of death. And so many, many supposed KJV only Baptists, they don't like this, you know, they they don't like this teaching. And whenever a KJV only Baptist doesn't like something that the Bible plainly spells out, there's a wonderful invention that's out there called dispensationalism that you can always run to. Dispensationalism dispensationalism will always help you with the things that are uncomfortable, the things that you just don't like, the things that you just... I don't like that the Bible says that. You know, how can I change that when we're King James only people? Dispensationalism. And unfortunately, it's gotten completely accepted in many Baptist churches. They're accepting this garbage. It's It's a bunch of garbage. And I'm telling you, these people need to stop calling themselves King James only people. Okay, when you're teaching, when the Bible says Jesus went to hell and you're saying, no, it was actually paradise. Don't call yourself a King James person, all right? Don't do that. Okay, there's a big difference between hell and paradise. Huge difference. I don't want to get ahead of myself. But the arguments against the teaching that Jesus went to hell, it is a great example of the mental acrobats that dispensationalism forces people into. And one of the great dispensationalists of our time, Dr. Peter Ruckman, all right? Brother Mark just gave me this Ruckman reference Bible, all right? And he was wanting me to get rid of it, but I'm telling you, man, there are some gems in here. Let me tell you, there, is, there are some gems in here. And let me tell you something. These people, okay, the mainstream Baptists, they cannot refute what we teach on end times. And they're scared to even try. And the only people that have the guts to even try to go against what we teach are the Ruckmanites. They're the only ones that have the guts to do it. And most Baptists are repulsed by what they teach. And you're going to see why here in a little bit. But they're still running to these bozos because they're the only ones that will stand up to us. They're the only ones that will face us on these things. But let me tell you, this guy was their hero. Alright? Ruckman was their hero. Let me, I read Acts 2. Y'all saw what it says. Let's read Peter Ruckman's commentary on Acts 2. This is great, folks. I mean, this is great. I've been trying to prove to people these people are nuts. Right, and if this doesn't prove it, I don't know what else does. It, it, listen to this. Although Peter preaches about Christ's death here, his burial, and his resurrection, he never applies those things as blood atonement for sin. This isn't preached until Acts 8:31 and 35 when Philip preached it from Isaiah. Now what's what, why would he say that? Listen, the dispensationalists are always real big on teaching multiple gospels, okay? This is who the Baptists are running to, these three gospel heretics, all right? Now that's a heretic right there. That's what somebody the Bible says, let him be accursed. They're going to these three gospel heretics. They say Jesus preached a different gospel than what Paul preached. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom and you know Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Different gospels. And they, the gospel that we preached didn't start getting preached until Acts 8. And so you ask these people, well, what is the gospel? It's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did you see Jesus when he was preaching the gospel mention the death, burial, and resurrection? So it's not the same gospel. And so they do. They make up all these rules to try to box everything in. But then Peter here, right here in Ruckman's own commentary, although Peter mentions the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's not the gospel because blood atonement is not mentioned. It's like if you don't mention every single element of the gospel, it's a different gospel. You know, sometimes it's just implied by the word gospel. You know, and and so they, I mean, right there he's saying eh, it's not the gospel, even though the death, burial, I mean, just their own rules. They can't even make fit together. They just they contradict each other. So let's keep reading what he says. It says in regard to the expression "the pains of death," okay, the pains. Because right, what are we going to do about that? Because we know Jesus didn't suffer in hell. Because the dispensationalists have these crazy theory. I'll share with you in a little bit. What are we going to do about this pains of death thing? Because that's really specific. In regard to the expression "the pains of death," your heart is pained when it is troubled. You can be in pain when near death. Pain includes fear and anguish. Pain is feeling the effects of wounds and bruises. These are the things that attend death. As a man, Jesus had a human body and a human soul and a human spirit. At his death, his spirit went back to the Father. His body went to the grave, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and his soul went straight down into the center of the earth through hell here. 
and came out leading captivity captive. So he's just, he, you know, it's like, you know, that's where you just don't do any commentary on that part, all right? When you just don't have an explanation, just don't say anything. So he's, he's going into these mental acrobats here. Well, you know, I know it says, I don't know, Jesus, he just went through hell because he was going to lead captivity captive. And I'm going to show you what captivity captive means. All you got to do is read the Bible a little bit and you can find out what captivity captive means. But they say that means, you know, he's leading captivity captives. Those captives, those Old Testament saints that were in the good part of hell in paradise, Jesus led them out of there up into heaven. Okay? That is ridiculous. Now, first of all, how would you get that from Acts chapter 2? Okay, you wouldn't get that at all. Anybody see Jesus leading anybody there when it says his soul is not left in hell? You don't see that. They get that from Ephesians. We're going to go there in a little bit because I'm going to show you the different arguments. But folks, that is ridiculous what I just read there. That is heresy, what I just read. That is who Baptists are turning to today, this man's disciples. He was a nut and his, fo- his followers are nuts. All right? I'm sorry, yeah. nuts not very nice, fine, heretic. You know, let's use a biblical word. All right? Let them be accursed. I'm telling you, it's wicked. So let's look at these arguments. This is what people are using. I'm going to show you tricks that preachers use when they want to lie to you. When they, want to, when they just can't prove something from the Bible, there are some tricks. And folks, I know these tricks, all right? I've been going to camp meetings since I was a baby, all right? And I have heard some of the worst preaching you can ever imagine in your life. I know how this stuff works, all right? I know how to do it. I refuse to do it, but I know how it works, all right? I've seen it done many times. I could do it if I wanted to, but I just, I refuse to do it. I want to have a good conscience. So the first argument that they use to prove that Jesus did not go to hell, and this is the big one. When Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. Right there. These heretics that say Jesus had to go to hell to pay for our sins. Jesus said it is finished on the cross. And these people, they're taken away from the cross and saying that it wasn't enough. He said it is finished. And then, here's what they do. I mean, boy, that sounds really good. And you all get pretty convinced right now. And then, they'll just go and they'll spend the rest of their message just showing all the messages about the cross and Jesus bearing you know, our sins on His body on the tree and the suffering in the flesh that He did. And you know, oh, what a wonderful... And listen, I agree with all that stuff. Jesus paid for our sins. He bore our sins in His body on the cross. He shed His blood as payment for our sins. But listen, He had a taste of death too. And they say, that they make a huge deal of that. It is finished. John 9.30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, He said, it is finished. And He bowed His head and gave up the ghost. That's it, folks. It was done. It was done right then. And anyone who thinks anything that needed to happen after that, you're adding to what Jesus had to do on the cross when He said, it is finished. That, my friends, is a dishonest argument. Because look what it says in John chapter 17, verse 4. I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now, when did Jesus say that? He said that in the garden before he died on the cross. He said, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. So when was it finished? Was it finished in the garden or was it finished on the cross? When did it get finished? There was a lot of things that Jesus had to do and there's still some things he has to do. But obviously, what he had to do was in phases. And he would finish one thing, and he would go to the next thing. And what is so stupid about the it is finished argument is, wait a minute, wait a minute, what if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead? Listen, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then the dead rise not. If there's no resurrection of the dead, our faith is in vain. So you know what? If you believe Jesus had to rise from the dead, you don't think the cross was enough. Isn't that? I mean, if we're going to use their logic, then if you believe Jesus had to rise from the dead, then you don't think the cross was enough. You're downplaying the cross because you think Jesus had to resurrect from the dead. And listen, He had to rise from the dead, but then you know what? After He was on earth, he still hadn't ascended to his father yet. Remember what he told Mary? Touch me not. I'm not yet ascended to my father. Why not? I thought you were finished. Well, no. He still had. He still had to go to heaven. And you know what? I'm saved today because of what Jesus did on the cross. But it doth not yet appear what I shall be. Why not? Because Jesus still has to return. 
And I have to see Him. And He has to change my vile body into one like His glorious body. Well, wait a minute. If He's finished, then why do I need to change? Why can't I just go to heaven just like this right now? I'm saved, right? It's finished. The work was done on the cross. I believed on Him. Let me go to heaven right now just like this. No. God's got to change my vile body first. So, once again, that it is finished argument. It's a joke. Jesus still has to come and rule and reign on earth for a thousand years. You know, Armageddon has to happen. There's still things that he has to do. And you know what? None of it takes away from the cross. And this is just a dishonest argument. And these guys do, man. They get going and they're preaching all this stuff about the cross and they'll get everybody whooping and hollering. And man, aren't these people that believe Jesus went to hell a bunch of heretics. They hate the cross. No, we don't. I loved all that stuff you said about the cross. I agree with that stuff you said about the cross. But just because Jesus said it is finished, it doesn't mean there still wasn't some things to do. His work on the cross was done. Payment for sin was done. But He now has to taste of death. So, it is, it is, it's dishonest at the most extreme form. And you do. You go on the internet, go anywhere, go to any preacher, and listen to them refute this teaching, and they will spend most of their time on the it is finished argument. And folks, you see how dishonest that is. Alright? You're an intelligent crowd. Okay? That is dishonest. And you know what? These preachers, they're not that stupid. Alright? I've heard some of these guys. They're smart when they're right. You know, they know how to read. They're being dishonest is what they're doing. These people, they're so loyal to their stinking Bible colleges and their camps that they're involved in that they just got to defend their guys. They got to defend their men. And they can't just be honest with the Scriptures. And they go into these arguments and it's a joke. And these people that are whooping and hollering and amen, that stuff are a bunch of fools. I'm sorry. I mean, you're just a bunch of mindless sheep. If you fall for that kind of argument, that's dishonest. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 21. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 21. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits afterward, they that are Christ that is coming, then cometh the end. Wait a minute, why is something else coming? Isn't Jesus finished? Now, then cometh the end when He shall have delivered up the kingdom to God even the Father, when He shall have put down all rule and authority and power. Wait, when did, he, when did He do that? Well, He hasn't done that yet, has He? But I thought it was finished. You know, For He must reign till He hath put all enemies under His feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Has death been destroyed yet? Wait, I thought Jesus said it is finished. You know, for He hath put all things under His feet, but when He saith all things are put under Him, it is manifest that He is accepted which should put all things under Him. And when all things shall be subdued unto Him, then shall the Son also Himself be subject unto Him that put all things under Him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why then are they baptized for the dead? So you know, He's just going on. There's still stuff to come. There's still things that are going to happen. And the fact that we believe that something happened after Jesus died does not take away from the cross one bit. That is a dishonest argument to do that. And, to, and I said, if I was messing with the cross, if I was downplaying with the cross, call me a heretic, all right? But just because I believe what the Bible says, that Jesus went to hell after he died and tasted of death for me, that doesn't make me a heretic and it doesn't mean I'm taken away from the cross. The cross is everything the Bible says it is. It's exactly what God said. Is That was payment, but he had to taste of death. And the method of bringing him to death was that cruel torment that he went through on the cross. And it killed him. And he died. And, it's not a, and it wasn't a death like the one that I will experience because for me to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. No, he actually tasted of death Went to, went to hell. Very clearly in the Bible. So that's the number one argument they use against it. Is, is Jesus said it is finished. Second argument, hell doesn't really mean hell. It means paradise. And that's a huge one, folks. People hang their hat on this one. And you know, just We don't have time to do this. Just do a word study of the word hell. Go read all the verses in the Bible where it talks about hell and see if you find anything good associated with hell. See if you find any positive references to hell anywhere in the Bible. Good luck with that. It's always bad, but yet for some reason, now when Jesus went to hell, it was actually paradise. And Sorry. Do a word study. 
You find me a verse where it makes hell look good ever. It's not there. That you know, that's 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 just ridiculous. And we're not even I'm not even gonna take time to prove that, folks. Just Google it or use a search program. Hell is always bad. Okay? Mark it down. Third argument they use the Old Testament saints could not go to heaven until Jesus paid for their sins. The blood atonement had not been made. And you know what's ridiculous about that too? These same dispensationalists, they will act like the Old Testament saints got to heaven through the you know faith plus works. But Jesus Christ, you know, he paid for our sins, and it's always been about faith without works. Okay, but they tr- they try to teach that, and you know and the same thing that's ridiculous too. You know, you've got some of these Ruckmanites that are out there. You know, you got the Bill Grady's and stuff that teach that God has another covenant with the Jews. Well, wait a minute. The new co- covenant or the New Testament was the body and, body and blood of Jesus. Okay, that's how we're going to get into heaven. So, are you saying there's another covenant? The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So is Jesus' blood going to have to be shed again? Or are they going to get remission of sins without the shedding of blood? That's never happened. Oh, they're going to go back to the Old Testament economy. And you know, they say these words, and that's not even in the Bible. Okay? You know, economy is not even in the Bible. They're going to go back to the Old Testament economy. But the Bible says in Hebrews, you know, the blood of bulls and goats, they can't take away sins. So it never it never took away sins back then. Okay, it was their faith. That took away that, and it was it was their faith that they had, and then it was Jesus' blood that took away their sins, even though it hadn't happened yet. The fact is, you know, because of the fact that God said it was going to happen, it is as good as happened. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. But um, but yeah, they say Old Testament saints couldn't go to heaven until Jesus paid for sins. But then wait a minute. Okay, the Gospels, and even the dispensations will tell you this, that's actually Old Testament, because Jesus hadn't died on the cross. You know, the death of the testator is when it starts anew. So when you read the Gospels, it's actually Old Testament until the death of Christ. Okay, well, in the Old Testament, when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he said, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living, you know, why did he say they were living when they were supposedly in the place of the dead? Because this is what these people will say, the real heretics. Well, it's not actually hell. You know, if you study the Greek, it's actually Sheol, which is the grave or the place of the dead in the Old Testament. Or no, the Old Testament was Sheol and the New Testament was Hades. And they'll go into all these things and it was actually this... But they'll all say it was the place of the dead. It was all a place of the grave. But wait a minute. The Bible says they weren't dead. Even in the Old Testament. If they were separated from God, if they were in the heart of the earth, away from God, if they were captive, then why wouldn't they be considered dead? Right. You know what? Because they weren't dead. They were in heaven with God. Yeah, that's because God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Why would If they didn't go to heaven, then why in Psalms 116, verse 15, would it say, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints? Why would that be precious to God if when they were absent from the body... They were in good hell, away from God. Why would that have been precious? Okay, It was precious because when they died, they went to heaven, just like we do today. And so, you know, like, you know, these things happen. But listen, if God says something is going to happen, mark it down as recorded history. It, it, it's ha- it's, if He says it's going to happen, it's as good as happened. Okay, it, there's, there's no changing that. Heaven and earth will pass away. My words shall not pass away. Okay, there is no what if. There is no what if Jesus hadn't died. What if Jesus didn't go to the cross? What if Jesus did? There is no what if. If God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. No what ifs. And when God said it was going to, God said these things are going to happen from the foundation of the earth. Psalm seventy-three, verse twenty-four: Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon the earth that I desire beside thee. Uh, So right here he said, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me to glory. Does that sound like hell or heaven? I I think it makes it pretty clear. He's talking about going to heaven right there. Hebrews 4.1 says, "Let uh, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, 
But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, that they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. The works were finished from the foundation of the world, but wait a minute, Jesus didn't die until, you know, 2,000 years, you know, you know or 4,000 years after creation. But here's the thing, it was declared of God it was going to happen from the foundation of the world. And if it's declared of God, it's as good as happened. Mark it down. God was not in heaven letting these people in saying, I, I can't let you all in. You know, what if Jesus fails in being the sacrifice? What if my word does not come to pass? And they, see, that's proof right there too that our gospel is the same gospel that saved him in the Old Testament. It's always been the gospel. It's all, even though it hadn't happened yet, it was already declared from the foundation of the world. It was recorded history. And therefore, God would accept their faith as, you know, for, they would, He would accept their faith and He would give them salvation just like He does today because even though it hadn't happened yet, God knew it was going to happen. He wasn't worried about it one bit. And so, it's just, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bad argument. Matthew 13, 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. Y'all see that? There's things, and this is what dispensationalism really is. The real definition of it should be, is it was just God, over time, dispensed more and more of His plan. God always had one plan. There's, you know, there's always been one word of God, but God gave it to them a little bit at a time. God never changed his plan. He just gave them a little bit at a time. But there were some things they didn't understand in the Old Testament. It was hidden from them. But later, God gave them another dispensation or a distribution or a dispensing. He gave them a little more of it and they understood more. They saw the plan more clearly, but it never changed. And it was always there. Okay, How do you hide something that's not already there? For something to be hidden, it has to have been there. And so this gospel, the plan of salvation, everything, it has always been around. It's just we know more about it today than they did back then. But in the end, even though they didn't know as much as we do now, they didn't have to know everything we know to get saved. You know what they had to do? They had to believe God. And it was accounted unto them for righteousness throughout the ages. Matthew 25, 34, Then shall the king say unto them in the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared unto you from the foundation of the world. Revelation 13, 8, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. I mean, he wasn't slain at the foundation of the world. Yeah, but you know what? God said he was going to be from the foundation of the world. And so it was recorded history from the beginning. That it was going to happen. And so, guess what? Old Testament saints went to heaven. Just like the New Testament saints. What about Elijah and Enoch? God took him. People try to say, oh, you know, he had, he, God's got him stored somewhere because it's appointed unto man once to die. And they're going to be the two witnesses and they're going to die someday because it's appointed unto man once to die. But wait a minute. Okay, and this is where dispensations like to put God in a box somewhere. All right, it's appointed unto man once to die. What about Lazarus? He died twice. Unless you think he's still walking the earth. All those people that Jesus raised from the dead, they died twice. Okay? But why did God take Enoch? God take, took Enoch so he would not see death. So why would God take him so he wouldn't see death, only so he could bring him back later and let him get killed? Now, he is going to do that with Elijah, and I think Elijah is totally okay with that. But you can't, you know, people are like, it can't be Moses. Because the point of the man wants to die. Well, you know what? If Moses complains about it, I already died once. God's got Lazarus up in heaven. Hey, Moses, I did it twice. All right, You can do it too. He'll have that little 12-year-old girl that I was talking about in the nursing home that Jesus raised from the dead. Say, hey, Moses, I died twice. All right, You can handle this. All right, It's, just, it's a terrible argument. These people are always trying to just force God in these boxes. And it is. It's, just, it's bad theology. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And so... If death, if, if hell or paradise was this place of the dead, wait, God said He didn't want him to see death. So He took him. He took him to heaven. Okay? He went to heaven way back then before the flood. So, 
That third reason, that's totally destroyed. The Old Testament saints couldn't go to heaven because Jesus hadn't died yet. And then the fourth thing they look at is in the Old Testament, they went to Abraham's bosom. And proof that that isn't heaven is that you can see hell from paradise. Okay, There was two compartments in hell. And everybody says that, two compartments in hell. Well, that's interesting. Did you get that from your, your theology book or did you get that from the Bible? Show me where the word compartment is in the Bible. Show me where it talks about two compartments in hell. These people act like they're not polyparroting people. I'll get accused of polyparroting for quoting Scripture, but they don't get accused of polyparroting when they say two compartments in hell. When they say hell is really paradise. They don't get, you know, they don't get accused of polyparroting for saying Old Testament economy. You know, they, they don't get accused of that for that, but I get accused of, par- of polyparroting because I says, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, nor stuff that I only want to see corruption. Ah, you're just polyparroting. You know, not fair, folks. All right? not, that, that, is, that is not fair. And these people, they can't play fair because they're just, they're just dead wrong is all there is to it. But listen, Revelation chapter 14, 9, cause, and I, we're not going to take time to read the story, but I remember you know, when a rich man died and was buried and there was Lazarus and he's in Abraham's bosom. That's the name of paradise. What do you think Abraham's bosom is? You know what I think Abraham's bosom is? I think it's Abraham's bosom. Right. <laughs> what are you talking about? Remember what... Abraham said, now he is comforted and thou art tormented. He saw Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. What's going on? He's there suffering in hell and he sees Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. What's he doing? He's getting a hug. He's getting greeted into heaven. That's what's going on right there. No, Abraham's bosom is a place. Where do you get that from? You get it from some college textbook somewhere. You can't get that from the Bible. You cannot take the Bible and show me that Abraham's bosom is a place. Well, no, it has to be a place. Because remember, he talks about the grave gulf fixed. And there's this one compartment in hell. And there's this big chasm, all right? And I, I've seen all the Ruckmanites draw their illustrations on their whiteboards. And, you know, nobody could get in there. You know, what happens if you jump down in the chasm, too? You know, by any, you know, nobody ever answers that question. And, you know, and then over there on the other side, that was paradise. And, you know, they didn't burn over there. And that's actually where Jesus went. Well, that's a pretty big stretch, seeing the Bible doesn't say that anywhere. Nope, it's right there in that story of the rich man and Lazarus because they could see each other. They could even talk to each other. Okay. All right, yeah, that did happen in that story. I believe that's literal. But listen, okay, where do we believe heaven is? We believe heaven's in the sky. But can we fly a rocket ship or an airplane and get there? Absolutely not. It's a spiritual realm. We believe hell's in the heart of the earth. But can we dig a hole and get into hell? No, we can't. It's a spiritual realm. So things aren't necessarily going to work the same in a spiritual realm that they do in the physical realm. Okay? So I could come up with a bunch of theories if I wanted to. I'm not going to waste your time with that. Let me just show you in the Bible where you can see hell from heaven. Revelation 14.9 And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever received the mark of his name. The Bible says that they are tormented in the presence of the Lamb and of the holy angels. Now, what does that mean? If it's in His presence, it means He can see it. Well, where's the Lamb and the holy angels? They're in heaven. And we see these people cast into hell, being tormented, and the Bible says it's done in the presence of the Lamb and the holy angels. So right there is a clear verse. Even a Ruckmanite would tell you in Revelation chapter 14 that that's heaven, and the other place is hell, and it says right there, it's in the presence of them. So you know what? Yeah, right there is proof, heaven and hell, they can see each other. Yeah, but we don't see them talking to each other there. Well, so what? You know, you, know, it, you don't have to have every little detail. You know, why, why it didn't need to bring that up? We don't see any conversation going on in the story. Okay, we do in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Okay, they can see each other. So I think we'd all agree, heaven's in the sky, hell's in the earth. But you know, and it does. It just causes people to scoff. How could you see hell from heaven? You know, the, the earth's in the way. You got to see through all the dirt. It's a spiritual realm, people. All right. You know, you just you're you're getting dumb on purpose on me now. We're now getting ridiculous because you don't like the fact that the truth is just right in your face. 
You know, well, you know, that's in the New Testament era. You know, but well, you know, Isaiah sixty six verse twenty two talks about, and I know this is talking about the future, but it says, "For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain." And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh to come worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring to all flesh. It's talking about from one new moon to another. They're going to be able to go, and they're going to be look. And where is it that the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched? Jesus talked about that, and He mentioned it several times. It's a place called hell. And from one new moon to another. This, that's not just one event. In Revelation, this is all the time. They can see the suffering of those in hell. Well, that doesn't sound very heavenly. Heaven's not going to be very good if you can see the suffering. Listen, it would be hard for us to see that in our sinful condition, but when we are in a glorified state, when we're like Christ, you know what we're going to see? We're going to see justice. We're going to see right that that's righteousness. Sin being paid for like that. And it won't it's not going to bother us like it would now. So then the fifth thing they use, Jesus told the thief that he would be with him in paradise. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now what are you going to do about that one? That proves right there that when Jesus went to hell, it was actually paradise. I'm telling you, man, do these people not feel uncomfortable calling hell paradise? I mean, you know, that that's got you would think they would be uncomfortable with that. Jesus said. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. But listen, Jesus Christ is a member of the Trinity. Okay? And in John chapter 14, verse 18, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And if you read that, He's talking about the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, I will come to you. Now, did Jesus come back at Pentecost? No, we're still waiting for Jesus to come back, aren't we? But the Holy Spirit sure did show up. And guess who Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as? He said, I shall come to you. And so when Jesus said, you're going to be with me in paradise, it's because you you can look at it two different ways. Either one works. One, he's going to be with heaven, you know, God in heaven. And the Holy Spirit's everywhere. And here's the other thing too. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Well, when the thief got to heaven, at what point, how many days was he in heaven before Jesus showed up in heaven. Now on earth, Jesus, it was 40 days, right? But here's the thing. Is there any night in heaven? And doesn't the Bible say a day, it says a thousand years and a thousand years is a day with the Lord? All right, time doesn't work in heaven. You know, if, if you went and asked the thief today, hey, how, how long have you been in heaven? How many days? I, I just got here, you know? It's just, you know, it's... It, that's ridiculous, okay? And that thief, I don't think he was set up there, man. It's been 72 hours and still no Jesus. He said today they're going to be... No, man, he's... St- you know, in his mind, I mean, it's gone by like nothing. All right? So, you know, first of all, you know, God's everywhere. Jesus is a member of the Trinity. He can speak on behalf of other members. But at the same time, even though it was 43 days later that Jesus Himself actually went to heaven, I don't think, think it seemed like 43 days to that thief. So, bad argument once again. Dishonest argument. Time doesn't work in heaven like it does down here. We all know, you know, 2 Peter 3 8. So, you know, and, and then once again, you know, hell is never called paradise. But we do see heaven in Old and New Testament eras, okay? Going by the dispensationalist rules here, right? Even if it's in the New Testament, if it's before Jesus died on the cross. Uh, it's Old Testament, but Luke twenty three forty two, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And I don't believe he was talking about hell. I believe he was talking about heaven. Okay? Right? That's Old Testament, isn't it? He hasn't died yet. He's about to, but he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And in 2 Corinthians 2, 12, 4, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Okay, right there, Paul said, caught up into paradise. No, paradise and heaven are different. But where in the world did Paul get caught up to? Well, paradise got transported to heaven. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, that's you know, I said I. You shouldn't be comfortable with that argument. That's so lame. Revelation 2 7, He that hath in here, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church, is to him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Okay? Paradise is in heaven. And heaven, 
Paradise is not hell. That is such a horrible argument. The thief went to heaven right away, but Jesus, you know, he hadn't gone to heaven even after the resurrection. In John 20, verse 16 and 7, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself, saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. Now, wait a minute. If Jesus went to heaven and not hell, or if he just went through hell, like Ruckman said, to lead captivity captive, then why did he say, I haven't ascended to my Father yet? Well, he said that because he hadn't ascended to his Father yet. That's why he said that. It's just real clear if you just believe the King James Bible and read English. So, sixth reason they do, I need to go through these quick. Samuel got called up from the heart of the earth. If you go and you look at the story, and we don't have time to read all of it, the story of the witch at Endor. And remember, Samuel or Saul goes to the witch, she wanted him to call up Samuel. And if you read the story, she goes to do her hocus pocus and she sees gods ascending out of the earth. Well, what do we think that? Well, I mean, these, these are demons from hell, right? And somebody comes up with them. Who is it? It's Samuel. An old man, you know, wearing a mantle. And so he came up, which means he was in the heart of the earth. He was in good hell. He was in, he was in, he was in good hell and he got called up. That is proof. You're going to take that story in the Bible and you're going to make a whole crazy doctrine about that. Now listen, that story right there, you know, this it is it's a classic example of taking an obscure story. That's pretty rare to see him calling up somebody like that. And it is a very demonic thing. But this, you know, and you know, to build a whole weird dock around that, I mean, that's hardcore Ruckmanite type thing. All right, they're real big into that stuff. But this story, it's not it's not teaching doctrines of heaven and hell right here. It's just telling us what happened. And you know, it could be when the witch was calling up the spirits from hell. She had a familiar spirit. I think most of the time, even today, when these people call up these spirits and they speak and they say these things that only the dead person could know, I think it's a familiar spirit. I think it's a demon imitating. Yeah. Is what I believe. And I think that's what this lady normally did, or this woman normally did. But you know what I think God did? I think God sent the spirit of Samuel through the very door that these devils are coming through. Why? Because he's going to send a message to Saul. And God chose to send him through that very door. I think he just showed up. And you know, because notice it says Samuel had the appearance of an old man. Does anybody think that when we're in heaven, we look like we're old? Did all those people who were in good hell, were they in the condition down there that they were when they died? I hope not, especially for the ones who died when they were really old and were really unhealthy. So why is it that the spirit of Samuel... Okay, first of all, it doesn't call, talk about the soul of Samuel. It's the spirit of Samuel that comes up and he had the appearance of an old man. God allowed his spirit, I believe, to go through that door and he had the appearance of an old man so he would be recognized that this was in fact Samuel. Is what's going on. And so, you know, God sent him with that earthly appearance so he would be recognized. All right, that, that, I mean, I'm not saying I know everything about that, but just because it says he came up, that doesn't prove a good hell that the Old Testament saints were at. You can't build a whole doctrine around that. That's just dishonest. Especially when Ecclesiastes 3.21 says, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. I like that verse. But by, it says in the Old Testament, the spirit of man goeth upward. Well, how could he do that? They can go to heaven yet. Yeah, they could. All right, just like it says right there. So you can't, you can't cancel out everything else in the Bible because of that story where something out of the ordinary happened. Okay, and that God did, I believe, because it shocked that woman when she saw Samuel. She was probably expecting one of her devils that normally did the dirty work, that normally did the imitating and stuff. But sure enough, it's not one of hers that she was used to. It was Samuel. And it freaked her out. Who did that? It wasn't her. God did that. All right. And God is the one that makes the rules. God is the one that's got control of everything. If He wants to send Samuel, the Spirit, through the door of the devils, He can do that. No problem. God has permission. Because He's the boss of everything. King of kings and Lord of lords. So then finally, quickly i got to go through this, that he led captivity captive. Isn't that what Ruckman said in his commentary right there in his Bible? 
He led captivity captive. Psalm 68, 18, Thou hast ascended on high, Thou hast led captivity captive, Thou hast received gifts for men. Yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. Ephesians, and, that, and then Ephesians 4, 8, quoting that, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but he that descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. Okay, so right here, this is where we get this from. He led captivity half. What does that mean? Well, he ascended, descended to the lower parts of the earth first, and he led captivity captive. What's that talking about? That's talking about all those Old Testament saints down in good hell. All right, he went and he led that. He he led them out. That's what that's talking about. But wait a minute. If these people were in paradise, okay. If these people, you know, were God's people, you know, why is it? First of all, why is it calling them captive? And second of all. Why aren't any people mentioned in there? And that's kind of obscure, wouldn't you say? Just that verse. That's not real clear. So we have to do something now in order to prove what that means. Something that Baptists never do. You're going to have to look at context and you're going to have to look at multiple chapters. In fact, you need to read the whole book of Ephesians. And don't worry, I'm not going to do that right now. But let me hit a few highlights for you to show you what captivity captive is. Ephesians 1.22, And he hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Put all things under his feet. What things? Well, Ephesians 2.11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers through the covenants of the promise, having no hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make Himself of twain one new man, so making peace, that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Jesus killed some things. Jesus destroyed some things. Jesus conquered some things. And He came and preached to you which were afar off and to them that are nigh. Okay, them who are afar off and them that are nigh. You know what that's talking about? Them that are afar off, the Gentiles. Them who are nigh, the Jews. Okay, they, there was a middle wall partition. There were things, there were ordinances that were against us because of the fact that we were Gentiles. We were not Jews. Those laws, those ordinances, they weren't given to us. We had, we didn't have the right bloodlines. We didn't have any of those things. But now, because Jesus Christ fulfilled those laws, He fulfilled all those carnal ordinances, He kept every single one of them, He broke down that middle wall partition. He took those things and He removed them from us. And so now, for through Him, we both, Gentiles and Jews, have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellowship citizens with the saints and of the household of God, Ephesians 3.5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, and is now revealed unto His holy apostles and the prophets by Christ, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of the promises of Christ by the Gospel. Ephesians has been talking about all the things that Jesus conquered and defeated and finished, and He did all that on the cross. He, took, he got rid of those things for us. And Colossians 2 says it best. Colossians and Ephesians have a lot of the same things in there. And he says in verse 10, Ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross, having spoiled principalities and powers, to make a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. 
What's that talking about right here? When Jesus was dying on the cross, okay, the world sees a man defeated, beaten, and bloody. But you know what we see? We see a man conquering our sins. We see a man fulfilling the law, completing everything, breaking down the middle wall partition, making a way of salvation, defeating the enemies that were against us. And I mean, not only is he defeating them, while they're looking at him and they're mocking him and spitting on him, the Bible says that he's conquering them and he's making a show of them openly. He's like that, you know, gladiator that, you know, wins a battle and just kind of for a victory thing, he takes a lap around the Colosseum dragging the body of the man he defeated. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He led captivity captive. Those things that stopped us from going into heaven, those things that made it impossible for us to have eternal life, Jesus Christ destroyed those things. He took them out of the way. And there is no Jew and Greek anymore. There is none of that anymore. But these dispensationalists, they still think that it's all about Jew and Greek. Jesus defeated that. He destroyed it. He conquered it. That's what leading captivity captive means. Not he went and pulled people out of good hell. Where do you get that? They just take that. They don't look at any context. Go read through Ephesians and see if we read about any place where they were in good hell and just waiting for Jesus to come and get them out of there. It's all about all the things that Jesus conquered for us and defeated for us. I mean, their story is so much lamer than what the real story is. All right? This is so much better. These people are missing out. Man, it, folks, it's not worth it being loyal to some stinking camp in Bible college. They're all lame. Yeah. Their doctrine's lame. It's wrong. The Word of God is wonderful. You just you can't get over it. And I don't have time to go on the next thing, but, but it was those things that He let kept. It was all the carnal ordinances that stood in our way. It was the things in the law that separate us, separate us from the people of God. Those things were conquered by Christ. They can't be used against us. Because Jesus defeated him. He destroyed him. But then, Jesus preached to the dead. And we don't have time to go in it, but 1 Peter talks a lot about that. And if you do the painful process of reading the whole book of 1 Peter, it's only five chapters, people. It's only five chapters. And if you look at context, it's all about, when it talks about preaching to the dead, it's talking about preaching to a condemned people. People who are as good as dead. It referred to in Noah's day. Okay? The world, it was condemned. But you know what? Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And you know what? The Gentiles were a condemned people. But you know what? The gospel still got preached to us. And you know what? We got saved. And you know what that's called? That's called life from the dead. And it's interesting because the Bible says the Jews, they, they were the branches that were broken off and God had concluded them all in unrighteousness. And what is the receiving of them again? life from the dead. The Jews today are just like we were at one time. What does that mean? It means there's no difference between Jew and Greek. Amen. Just like the Bible says. And preaching to the dead is just talking about preaching to a condemned people. That was all of us. Ephesians 2. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. This wasn't Jesus going down and while he was in paradise, he's yelling across that chasm, y'all are in hell because... You're all sinners. What about all those people behind you, Jesus? They were sinners too. <laughs> you know, it's just it's ridiculous. And you you think the Bible would have told us what Jesus said when he was down there? You know, it just it's 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 made up dispensationalism garbage, and there's no argument for it. So you can't get around the fact that God, the Bible makes it very clear that Jesus suffered in hell. Pains that it's right there in Acts chapter two. To get around it, you have to change meanings of the word. You have to go into all kinds of strange interpretations and weird doctrines. But I lastly believe that Jesus went to hell because He's our Passover Lamb. Amen. If you read about the Passover Lamb, I don't have time to read it. In Acts chapter 12, verse 8 and 9, you know what it says to do with that lamb? You have to eat the flesh at night and you roast it with fire. That's right. Everybody knows the Passover Lamb is a picture of Jesus Christ. Everyone knows that. But nobody ever talks about the part where they roast the lamb with fire. What do you think that represents? Jesus Christ going to hell. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Purge out there for the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. It's pretty clear. You know what? When you look at the Passover lamb, 
It looks like God not only knew that Jesus was going to die, He was going to shed His blood, He was going to make payment for our sins, but when He roasted Him with fire, He knew He was going to go to hell too. Why, did he, why would He do that? That said, I, The cross was everything. All right, He paid for our sins, but the cross is what killed Him. He ha- because He had to die so He could taste of death. And to, just, and to say that's taking anything away from the cross is just a dishonest argument, and it just goes completely contrary to what the Bible says. Amen. It's right there in English for us. Every word of God is pure, and we've got to stop listening to these people. Baptists need to wake up, and they've got to lay off this loyalty to camps, and they need to get honest with the Word of God. And you know what? Maybe God would breathe some life back into their churches. Maybe they'd stop being so dead and so lame. Maybe they could, you know, they wouldn't have to spend all their money doing all these fun center things, converting their buildings into fun centers, and maybe they could just go back to preaching the Word of God. But they can't do that because they're preaching a watered-down, lame version of the Word of God because they don't want to offend people. The only way they can get them in, they got to do the fun stuff. they got to put on the shows. And these poor preachers, man, I mean, it, it must zap their souls to just get up and to twist the Bible like that. I believe some of these people are good men. I believe they have good hearts. And it's like, how do they miss this? I know how they miss it, folks. There, there's pressure in the preacher world. We struggle with pride. We deal with all that stuff. And let me tell you something. You know, Phil Kidd, he always says, I'm divorced from public opinion. You know what? I'm ashamed to say there was a time, I think after, maybe after he divorced her, I might have married her. But you know what? I'm thankful to say, I've now divorced her and he's remarried her. And let me tell you something. I heard a man say one time, he lost 200 pounds and a pain in the neck in one day. He got divorced. And let me tell you, man, when you get divorced from public opinion, it is the most liberating thing in the world. And boy, these preachers, they don't know what they're missing. Divorce that battle axe. All right? And get rid of her. She is, I mean, ruining your preaching. She's ruining all the fun. And just get loyal to the Word of God. And you know what? Maybe God will start showing you some things. And maybe every single message you preach won't be, read your Bible, pray, listen to your preacher. And make your people every week, listen to your Bible, pray, read your preacher. You know, listen to your preacher. Everywhere they go in the Bible, it all turns into, read your Bible, pray, listen to your preacher. That is so stinking lame. Alright? Give them something different every now and then. God's just not showing them anything. Well, maybe if you would start being loyal to what God shows you, He'll show you something else. And these churches are dead because of loyalty to people like this guy. To Ruckman. What a weirdo. What, that's a heretic right there. Not me. Just because I believe when the Bible says Jesus went to hell, He went to hell. So, anyway, with that, let's go ahead and we'll stand together.